Hello, everybody, and welcome to PGL at the end of this LEC summer semifinal. I'm Frosk, <laughs> joined here by Sha. Is it you welcoming me to PGL or me welcoming you to Euphoria? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know, actually. That's a good one. <laughs> um, also, uh, usually, of course, we have a player guest. This will not be the case today um, because G2 has to prepare for tomorrow. And obviously, they don't have too much time to do that. But we did hear from the winner interview, so it is all good. So we're going to talk a lot about G2 in preparation for tomorrow. But first, let's say goodbye to Rogue, who had, I mean, a valiant fight, I would say. Once again today, we saw different sides. And I walk away with a p more positive feeling than I had about them when they locked that world spot initially. Yeah, and again, I, I really just want to reiterate, I hope that people don't kind of rewrite the history of Rogue right now, because it was, I'm going to say a week and a half ago that I saw tweets like, you know, no one should be qualified for Worlds from regular split. Oh, why isn't Schalke going? Just like very down on Rogue. And I think with their turnaround series against Mad Lions, um, their performance today against G2, that Europe can feel very happy that this is the third seed representing us on the international stage. And uh, again, just reiterating this point of, this is a series that defines careers. We didn't really know what the ceiling was of this team because frankly, they're so young and they're so new outside of Han Sama and Vander that you just hadn't seen them have an opportunity to reach that. And now given the opportunity to go toe to toe against G2 in this series, they hit, the, they hit the ceiling. I'm really happy what I saw with Rogue. I feel like you can see that they can continue to push past it and that this is a team that we can be proud of. And exactly, uh, as you've brought up a couple of times when you do go to World and you get to scrim these teams that you have never played again, hopefully that will unlock more in Rogue still. Um, however, that last game specifically, they had chances to win that game, Frosk, even though... Um, you know, it looked dire at times. You had that top lane fight where then um, Hansama can cash in and gets a couple of kills. You know how strong he is at, at a certain point in time. So what in the end made it uh, go in G2's favor? Um, I think, I know that Mickey had just said this, and I don't want to give this as all excuses, but draft was, I think, an issue from Rogue. I didn't like the balance of the composition entirely. I think that one of the key things that they were missing was hard engage, you know, outside of the Nautilus. You kept saying it, and I was like, I really wish they had hard engage right now. <laughs> um, outside of the Nautilus, you know, I would have preferred uh, an Orn, something of this nature that could force them to, or could give them tools to force fights, especially when they started to get early game leads. Um, I was really scratching my head about the Aatrox pick. I know that it is a comfort pick for Finn. Uh, we've obviously seen him really pop off on the Aatrox, but you know, falling that far down in CS, and this series isn't entirely on him, but at the same time, there, need was to call a, someone out, yeah. there was a big top difference, and it is kind of one of my flags. I really want to see the, the carry fin that we know exists there because you're going to be going against 369, uh, Ben, Zoom, and these are just the LPL top laners. This is never mind the Korean top laners that are coming, and it's just a little scary. Yeah, I mean, even the EU top laner in this one <laughs> um, with Wonder. The key up player of the series wasn't Wonder. I mean, people keep saying he gets robbed. I don't know if it was the same in this case. Uh, Caps, however, won with 50% of the votes and I guess you could make um, the argument that Caps was up versus Larson and we were talking so much about how this mid lane matchup was going to decide so much and that you know they're one and two in all pro and they are the strongest mid laners they have so in that regard Caps did have his work cut out for him. Yeah and Larson really got the better of yeah. Caps sometimes. Uh I think it's also true that Caps did have a 1v9 performance in some of these games. That Zoe game in particular was really just Caps, uh, even some of those Cinder performances. So I think it is well-deserved for Caps. No lie, Wonder also had a really consistent series. Yep. Um, but Caps continues to be the difference maker and frankly, I think dragged G2 over the line in this one. Who dragged G2 down in this one? <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I would say the bot lane and the jungle were having some issues there. You know, if they want to say that that's draft or the execution of the draft, like, I get it and I agree. I think the draft adjustments that G2 made over the series were better, but also there were some critical thinking errors here. This was, you know, G2 forcing fights when they absolutely did not need to, making bad rotations, taking bad trades. I think the epitome of that top lane fight that we just saw yeah. in the last game where Caps isn't even there and they decide to go in for it anyway, I'm just like, why? Mm, yeah, I feel you on that one. Uh, we're going to have to see if G2 cleans it up for tomorrow. But to uh, wrap up this rogue tale, we will get some more insight as Laure is standing by with their coach. Thank you very much, Shox. Wrapping up for now, though, because we're going to see you guys again soon at World. Freddy, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, good to be here.
Yeah, I'm sorry things didn't work out for you today, but I was, I was, as I was saying, we're going to see you guys again in two weeks. I guess you will be leaving for China uh, soon. I want to talk about the prep that you guys are going to go through to be ready in China. So first, how do the players feel uh, about going there so early uh, because of the sanitary situation we have? I mean, honestly, I think the players are really happy to go there early because the earlier we go, the faster we can start screaming like the Chinese teams, see see what it's all about, and just get the experience right to play against the best. And yeah. for us, moving forward, the players world is it it is a big growth experience mm -hmm. for them still, right? So. Uh, really happy to like go to Worlds yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah, we're, we're so happy to see you guys there. I mean, we're looking forward to see Rogue at Worlds. And uh, I want to know, who are you going to bring there? Is it going to be the whole staff? Or are you leaving some people behind because you have to focus on minimal stuff? I, I don't know how this works for you guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're bringing kind of all the essential uh -huh. stuff. We're, we're missing two staff members, which is a bit sad, right? But. It's just the way the situation is that uh, we have to do that. Uh, all the like coaching and mm -hmm. performance related people will be there present. All right. And yeah. you, uh, do, do you have a schedule, something planned to get ready for Worlds? Like I, I know I've been talking a lot to Ismail about what he's been doing with Rogue this year. Uh, are you going to continue yeah. on the sa with the same approach or is it different now that you're going to face other teams in another setup? No, I think we we continue on the same approach, like what worked for us. Like, obviously, we have to find ways to deal with this uh, kind of two week period where we can't all be together. So I think every team is going to be preparing something to keep the guys like together and hanging out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like online. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we will continue on all our routines and stuff that we've been doing, and uh, yeah, everything that's been right. working for us, right? All right, I have a couple more questions for you. First, we're starting to have a majority of teams. That mm -hmm. My team wants to face, right? But I think in general, we just really want to play the teams from LPL because I mean, it's just like so exciting to play like other regions, right? And yeah. the different styles, there's like a lot of style clashes going on. So, and for me personally, I want to like experience how their kind of drafting style is a bit different from Europe. Uh, yeah, just, just the LPL teams really. All right. Well, I'm so looking forward to see you guys there. Thank you very much, Freddy, for the interview and best of luck at Worlds. Thank you. And back to you, Shocks and Frocks. <laughs> <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Laura. Très bien fait. <laughs> We're just, uh, we know it's Laura. It's an inside joke and might not come across. Anyway, <laughs> um, Frosk. Yes. Yeah, you wanted to react to the interview. Yeah, so um, we had perks on Euphoria this week. By the way, check that one out. Um, and we were talking about preparing for quarantine and going into it. And perks was very adamant that he was like, I got to, you know, like I'm mentally prepared for it. Uh, I've been through it before, so I feel like I'm ready. He was considering upgrading a room because he's like, I'm going to be stuck in that room for two weeks. And Fair game. <laughs> exactly. I, I need a lot of space. Um, and I... It is something to always think about that when you have really young and experienced rosters like the Mad Lions and Rogue, you know, you either take them into a situation like we have with Worlds where they go into quarantine, they go into the bubble system, and they absolutely thrive because all they want to do is sit down and play League of Legends, ex experience the other teams, and be excited to be there. Or you have a situation where you put them into a really high stress environment because it is probably the most important tournament, although not necessarily a lot of stress on their uh, or expectations on their shoulders mm -hmm. outside of what they want to accomplish. And you just grind them out and they're not mentally prepared for it. And it kind of goes one way or the other. And it is hard to kind of track that human element of it, but it is something to also watch. Like, I think that there's so much that Mad Lions and Rogue can learn and gain from Worlds. I love international tournaments for that reason, but I am a little bit afraid and I do hope that the orgs really take care of their players uh, and, and really, you know, make them comfortable in what is a very extreme situation. I mean, I totally agree. I, I hope they will. I, you're bringing it up, but I've seen it firsthand uh, at international tournaments. You've lived through it. <laughs> yeah, but the LPL teams, for instance, who bring in the massagers and the food specialists and make sure that their players are as comfortable as they yep. could most possibly be. So I hope that um, other teams do the same, especially because this is going to be such a mentally straining and different situation, even with the added pressure of kind of, you know, the quarantine and all that. So you're very right to call that out and we will see. Uh, we're not done here, though, yet in 
Europe tomorrow, we will have G2 facing Fnatic. Rogue finished third in the LEC summer season. That does also mean that they go into Worlds as the third seed and Mad Lions the fourth. And G2 and Fnatic duke it out for the trophy and for first seed. I know, everyone is shocked. No one saw this what? coming. <laughs> Very big. No, in all seriousness, like credit to the riders. We had some really great twisted turns this split. You know, Mad Lions, Don't Rogue, feed the trolls. The <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say this. G2 do not look great right now. Um, Fnatic didn't look great coming into playoffs and now have suddenly really found their form. But we said this last split, like, you you assume that Fnatic are the favorites here. You're like, this feels yeah. pretty confident, pretty strong. Today's series wasn't the cleanest series of League of Legends. G2 in particular have a lot to work at. But for whatever reason, like, these teams know each other so well. They've played each other so many times that it almost feels like anything that you thought you knew about preparing for the series, you almost have to kind of just throw it all out because... They just know this is what this guy plays. This is what this guy likes to pick in this situation. They have a better sixth sense for it. And that's why I think that they also play better when they do face each other. And to that, um, I mean, last time we said uh, you get more tape to watch from G2. They went to, down to the lower bracket. It's the same now. And in essence, if you're a fanatic, you should have been able to see so much today because this was a five game series. We saw a lot of different sides. But uh, do you think we saw G2 being pushed in the terms of it limiting their inventiveness tomorrow to a point where it's going to hinder them? Or do you think G2 is going to be just fine? I think if you're Fnatic, the best tape that you take away, take away from this is uh, G2's draft priorities and kind of what they're they're leaning on and what's happening. Um, and you can try to punish there. I feel like uh, Fnatic, oh, it's weird. Because they have a more flexible draft in some positions and then they don't in others. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it'll always come down to. Um, that both teams have kind of like clear defined strengths and weaknesses. Current form though, I think Fnatic should be favorites. But as we always say, you never know. And you have to just assume that both teams will just come swinging and punching and kicking and screaming throughout the entire series. I just hope it's not a 3-0. I just don't want a 3-0. No, I don't want a 3-0 either. Because like in spring, we were like, is this the best possible form that both teams have been in at the same time when they face each other? And it was such a stomp that it tilted Fnatic for the whole of summer until a couple of weeks ago. Wouldn't that so, just feel like the most classic, just like uh, BS thing though? If we have like all these five game series, it goes all the way and then the final comes around and it's like 3-0. Like, see you, good night. No, I won't be okay frost i can feel it it won't be uh tomorrow <laughs> fanatic and g2 they're going to face off at 5 p.m cest there will also be a one hour ready check before that and a bunch of other cool stuff i'll fill you in in just a second uh, it is a rematch from the spring finals um yeah you're saying that fanatic is the favorite in your regard i mean just look at that caps versus reckless uh the storyline of kind of the old team is like a dead horse that's been beaten over the head with a but it was, it was really interesting. We were actually like trying to uh, reimagine that dead horse narrative yeah. uh, of like the pillars of Europe because it felt like the rivalry really was dead. You know, before we had that mm -hmm. best of five, that Fnatic walked away with, that it, it wasn't close, especially enough. And I was kind of thinking like, okay, well, how do you, what is the important story here? Because I do... I know that people like joke about it and say like, oh, narrativitis, like, oh, they, all they talk about is narrative. Exactly. But it's like, <laughs> it is really important that... Personally, I think the difference between, ah, uh, yes, LeBlanc versus Morgana is nothing compared to uh, Faker's undefeated LeBlanc versus the Faker Slayer pawns Morgana in game five, where they, you know, like that matters. And for this uh, rivalry and matchup, whatever you want to call it, the greatest thing is the prestige of both these teams, specifically Fnatic as well. If you want to be the best player in Europe, kind of in any position, at some point you will have to have worn one or two of these jerseys. And it, it kind of almost reminds me of like the Rocks Tigers in a sense. And obviously newer viewers won't really know that team, but it's just like, it all came together and the players that walked through with those jerseys went on to do incredible, amazing things. And just think about how many players have worn a Fnatic or G2 jersey and what they've gone on to do, not just in Europe, but also in North America. And the collective and championships. Exactly. And then come back. <laughs> the collective championships that they have. And I think that's what's still really exciting, even if you don't necessarily believe in the G2 Fnatic rivalry, which the fans always do. They love beating each other. 
But just the prestige of seeing these teams, the fact that you throw a rock and anywhere you hit, you're going to hit an incredible player. Yeah, exactly. And an incredible matchup. And I know it's one of those where I know that a lot of, you know, if you're not a fan of G2 and Fnatic, uh, you're like, oh, this again. But I think regardless of that, you have to give, you know, the, the credit and the respect to what these teams are just continually able to do. And that's why they end up versus each other. Um, we're going to move on in just a second. But one matchup I want to get your take on uh, before we get into tomorrow is today. This match between Rogue and G2 got so much spicier because of Caps versus Larson and the level that Larson was able to play at. How do you think that's going to look with Nemesis versus Caps tomorrow? I still don't think Nemesis is in the form that we saw uh, him previously and at Worlds. Because that's the thing, like, Nemesis didn't have a great year, but we know that he can be a great player. Like, he showed up against some of the best competition. He, like, solo killed Faker twice. Like, this guy can play. Uh, but it just isn't there right now. That said, I don't think it really matters in the current way that Fnatic are playing. And I think Nemesis is doing his job to the team. And he doesn't have to be a Larson. Like, Larson's responsibility to Rogue is that he must carry. He mm -hmm. is, like, the big power for them. Whereas that's not Nemesis' responsibility. So True. it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges. Um, but I do hope to see, obviously, both teams in best form. Like, I just want good League of Legends. What I hate is when one team plays <laughs> okay and the other team plays worse. And I'm like, Ugh. come on, guys. Like, let's just both play good and one team plays better. And that very rarely happens. But usually when these two teams face, usually, that does happen. Well, let's hope so. Let's see if we see that tomorrow. Um, usually we take a PGL selfie, and we're still going to do it today. We have no players, but it's just going to be me and Frox. Are we walking? Me and Frox. No, just like right here, I think is fine, because we're not. Actually, they can be can in the I background, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, They can be. Oh, yeah, I Reckless, can you, guys, can you guys just like. <laughs> can you move to the left or the right? All right, here we go. Nice. Tradition honored. <laughs> that was all from us here in Berlin, but uh, across the Atlantic, rather. Team Liquid and TSM are clashing on the Rift, and we will be back tomorrow for the last day of the LEC 2020 season, and a whole day of stuff before that. Go check the schedule, but we'll see you tomorrow. Let's go, Broxa! Inspired and lost in a one